Okay, here we are. Welcome to today's live coding stream from Treehouse here in the Portland office. Um, my name is James Churchill. I'm just making sure that, that uh, my audio is working and you can hear me. So uh, someone give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can uh, actually hear me. That'd be great. And no, this is not what Kenneth Love looks like without a beard. Um, I am, in fact, a different person than Kenneth. Kenneth is at uh, Py PyCon this week. Um, so I'm going to be hosting the, the live stream today, which is great. This should be a lot of fun. We're going to be building an ASP.NET Core application. Uh, and hopefully, if we have time, we'll actually build a, a simple Angular front-end application uh, to call that API as well. So what we're going to do to start here, let me bring up my notes. We're going to kind of just dive into to .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, Talk a little bit about what it is for those of you who, who haven't um, or aren't familiar with that, uh, what ASP.NET Core is, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Sorry, I'm just bringing up my, my chat here. Thank you for the thumbs up. Okay, so ASP.NET Core, and let, let's actually go to uh, let's go to the .NET website. Let me get a browser window up here. Okay. Oops, where'd you go? So the ASP.NET Core, I did that kind of fast. Um, let me, so the URL is really, uh, I guess you could say clever. So you go to dot.net and that will redirect you to, this, to the page that, that has information about the .NET framework. Now, um, let's make a distinction here. There is the .NET framework, which has been around for, she's I don't know, 17 years now um, or thereabouts. And there's .NET Core. So .NET Core is a newer version of the .NET framework. Uh, one of the things that distinguishes itself from, from the previous version of, of the .NET framework is that it's cross-platform. Um, so if you're not on a Windows machine, uh, you can still do development using .NET Core and ASP.NET Core, even if you're on a Mac or Linux machine. So that's pretty great. It's nice to have that option. To get that installed on your machine, there's a couple different ways. If you're on a Windows machine, you could, of course, just go get Visual Studio. So if you go to, if we just Google Visual Studio, well, if I typed it correctly, there's actually a visualstudio.com website. And if you browse to that, um, you can grab Visual Studio Community 2017. Uh, the community ver version of Visual Studio is free, um, whereas professional and enterprise will cost you will cost you money. So uh, the community version tends to be popular because it's it's freely available. So you can download that. Um, that will give you uh, everything you need in order to do .NET and ASP.NET Core development. If you don't want to use Visual Studio or if you're on a Mac or Linux machine, then you can just download .NET Core, the SDK, uh, and that give you that will give you command line tools that you can use with basically any, any editor that you want. Though Visual Studio Code uh, is a popular option if you're not on Windows or even if you are on Windows, you can use it there as well. So let's let's take a quick look at that. So Visual Studio Code. So it's code.visualstudio.com. So Visual Studio Code, uh, 
in comparison to Visual Studio, it's a lightweight editor. So whereas Visual Studio is a full-blown IDE, Visual Studio Code is more like Sublime or more like Atom, if you're familiar with those editors. Uh, it's, it's a much, much smaller installation. So instead of being like, you know, uh, measured in gigabytes, it's measured in, you know, tens of megabytes, right? So I think it's just around 100 megabyte download. It's really small, really quick and easy to download cross-platform. So it runs and works the same whether you're on Linux, Mac, or Windows. Uh, and that will allow you not, not only to work well with a lot of different things. Um, you can write Node, uh, Python, uh, C Sharp. So just a lot of different stuff. Great editor. That's what we'll be using uh, at times during the live coding today. Um, and I think I'll probably also jump over to Visual Studio just so you can kind of see the difference between those two environments. They are quite different. Um, when you're writing code, the C Sharp code or the ASP.NET code itself, it's it's not the, the, the experience is not that completely different, but everything sort of else surrounding it uh, is very different. So .NET. Again, you can go to downloads here and we want not .NET Framework, but .NET Core. And then um, we want the SDK. And so you can see we can have a Windows installer. Uh, there's a Mac OS installer and Linux. So I am on a Windows machine and I clicked the Windows X64 installer, downloaded that, ran it installer. Once that's installed, we can open up uh, a command prompt and I'm going to be using PowerShell. Though CMD, um, the older commands, command line prompt would work just fine as well. So from here then, uh, let me bump up my font just a little bit. Make that a little bit larger. Make that easier to see. Excellent. Yeah, someone just mentioned, uh, Ali mentioned the VS Code is great for TypeScript. Absolutely. Um, one of the, the cool things about VS Code and TypeScript is that you can just start using it like out of the box. Um, there's nothing you have to install, whereas like an Atom, you have to install the, the TypeScript, uh, Atom TypeScript extension, which is a really great extension. Um, but it just, Vis Visual Studio Code just makes it really easy to get started with TypeScript. We'll see a little bit of TypeScript today. We're not going to go into great detail with that, but we'll see that when we do some Angular development. So uh, the command for .NET Core is simply .NET. So if we type .NET, um, we'll see some basic information about it. We'll see what our version is. Uh, I'm using, going to be using 1.1 today. Uh, so last week at Microsoft's Build Conference, um, which is sort of their yearly developer conference, similar to Google I.O., which just happened this week, Microsoft had theirs last week. And they announced the preview of .NET Core 2.0 and ASP.NET 2.0, but we're not going to be using those today. They're still in preview. Maybe we'll do another live coding session uh, in the near future where we look at the newer version and um, you know, sort of compare and contrast between what we have in currently released now versus what's coming down the pipeline. AJ, uh, I saw your message in the chat. Thanks for joining. All right, so what can we do with this? So there are a variety of commands um, that we can use, uh, but the one that we are going to use right off the bat is .NET new. So if we say .NET new dash H, that will give us some help about the new command. And the new command is for creating new projects as you might expect. And there are a variety of templates you can think of these, if you've ever used uh, Yeoman, if you've done JavaScript development, if you use Yeoman, well, I guess it's not just for JavaScript development. It's, it's when you're using like a Node and NPM, uh, Yeoman is a, is a code generator. It has a variety of templates. This is kind of sort of the same thing. Um, we've got some templates that we can use to create certain project types. So for instance, uh, what we'll do here is we'll say .NET new, uh, well, actually, let me let me make sure that I'm let me make sure that I'm in uh, a folder that makes sense here. So I'm going to go to my desktop, and then let's 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 make a new directory, uh, and we'll call this uh, live coding. 
we'll go into live coding and then let's just let's just create a uh, console app oops so let me make that directory so make dir uh, what was I gonna say oh yeah console app and then we'll CD into that so now we're inside of an empty folder and let's run uh, .NET new so we'll say .NET new and console, which is um, uh, is the is the name of the template. So someone just asked, Ethan, you just asked, is this like a follow along? Um, if you want to follow along, I suppose I'm certainly not going to to do this. Like there may be parts that we do faster um, where you may not be able to catch up. But the whole point of the live coding stream is we're going to build something, or I'm going to build something, and I don't have anything any code that's been pre-written or, or prepared. We're going to build something from scratch. Um, I'm going to get stuck along the way. And uh, when I get stuck, we'll, we'll do some research. We'll, we'll figure out how to work around the problem. Um, so it's all about being real here and, and less of a, like a prepared talk, if you will. And it's more about just, hey, let's write some code. And the topic today happens to be ASP.NET Core and Angular. And we're starting with ASP.NET Core. We're working up to that. And I just wanted to start with creating a simple console application. And then we'll, we'll jump in and we'll create a web app and then go from there. So uh, we can see here that, that .NET new, the template, and we created a console app. So what does that mean? Well, if we list the contents of this directory, we now have two files in here. We have console app.csproj and program.cs. And we can uh, use code dot to open up Visual Studio Code, um, which will allow us to, to actually see uh, the contents of those files. So let's take a look once this finishes this opening. This is just the welcome page. So this is uh, Visual Studio Code, in case you haven't seen that before. Um, we have one, exactly one code file. So if we open up program.cs, this is our application. And it's a very, very simple console app. So we have a namespace. Namespace you can think of as like if, if, if you're familiar with modules uh, in other languages like JavaScript, um, it's a container for our code. Uh, it's a way of isolating you know, uh, parts of our application in, into different, you can almost think of them as, as folders even though, uh, well they often do match the folder structure on the file system, the namespaces do, because you can, you can do dots. Um, you know, so we can extend the namespace. Uh, it doesn't have to mirror it necessarily, but it often does. So our root namespace is the name of our application, console app. And then we have a class. Uh, everything in C-sharp gets put into a class. So our class is named program. And then we have a method, static void main. Static just means that we can call this method without having to instantiate the class first. The method is associated with the class. And then we're going to do a console.writeline hello world. We also in our project have this console app.csproj file. Um, you can see there's not much in here, but this is just um, basically some configuration um, for our project so that the .NET CLI, the development tools, um, can do certain things with it. So for instance, if we come back out to PowerShell, we can say .NET restore. Everything in .NET Core is, in terms of uh, code that we write against, in terms of the libraries, is delivered uh, in packages. So again, it's, it, to compare it to something that maybe you're all familiar with, um, if you're doing node development, uh, you use NPM to go get packages. And th the same thing is true here. When you're doing .NET Core development, you go get the packages that you need, and then you can build and run your application. So .NET Restore was basically doing like a uh, npm install would be the equivalent npm command. And now we can say .NET build. And that will use the, the .NET Core compiler, the C-sharp compiler in this case, to build our application. And we can see that it succeeded and there's zero er warnings and zero errors. Now we can say .NET run. And there it is in all of its fantastic glory. So we have, there's the text, hello world, which corresponds over in Visual Studio Code. If we go back and look at our program.cs file here, 
Uh, that's what this console right line hello world is. Okay, very simple. We don't have time today to go into all the nuts and bolts of um, C Sharp and ASP.NET Core. So we're gonna be moving through this pretty quick, but, but this is as basic or as simple of an application as you can create with .NET Core, but it's not a web app and we want to create a web app. So let's do that. So we're in this console app folder. Let's go up a level. Uh, so Jay was just asking, sir, the Angular is not done yet. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see what the rest of that question was. Uh, come on, chat window. Oh, there it is. It's clicking on the wrong thing. Um, no, the, oh, well, the, the Angular app that we're going to be writing today is not done yet. We'll be using the Angular CLI uh, to create that application a little bit later. So hang with us. And um, so we'll, we'll, this stream is two hours long. Uh, we just started at 10 o'clock and we'll go to noon. So we'll see how far we get, but we'll definitely at least create an application uh, and call our API that we're gonna be creating for ASP.NET Core and display something there. So, okay. So Ethan, you said, uh, okay, couldn't grasp on your ASP.NET or ASP course. I'm definitely going to give another try. Yeah, please do. And we'll, we'll go through some of it here. But again, if you have questions about anything that I'm showing, um, then uh, that'd be great. Oh, so Ethan asked, what's the application gonna do? We haven't talked about that yet. Um, but let's 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 circle back on that. Um, let's create now, just so you can see how it easy it is to create like a basic shell for an application. And then we'll talk about what our API is going to do for us. Um, actually, I have a couple ideas, but we'll let you guys weigh in too. So now we can uh, let's make another folder. So now we'll say mk make directory, and then we'll just we'll just call this web app. And then we'll use .NET New again. Actually, I don't remember the template name. So let's say .NET New H to get the help. And let's see down here in the templates, console application was console class library unit test. Okay, so we have a couple different of uh, three different ASP.NET Core uh, templates that we can use. Uh, MVC. Um, is the one that I'm looking for. So we'll start with that. Uh, Ali asked, will you be using Angular 2? Uh, actually, I think we'll end up using um, the latest version, which is Angular 4. So we'll we'll start by using the CLI and the CLI, I believe is gonna use the latest version. Um, so you, it, for those who don't know, they went from Angular 2 to Angular 4, uh, just to keep the version numbers in sync with the Angular router, which had gone from two to three to, to two to three, and so to keep them in sync, Angular skipped three and went to four. It's kind of confusing, but everything is now 4.0 in Angular land. Um, not as big of a change from Angular one to Angular two. So don't, don't worry about that. Uh, the jump from Angular two to Angular four is much, much smaller. Um, and conceptually, you still build apps the same way. There's just some refinements and improvements that have been done. Um, we're gonna start to see the version numbers for Angular uh, increase at a faster rate. Um, they're doing uh, Simver like Node does, for instance. Um, and, I, and I think if I remember correctly, it's the odd numbers that will be uh, not supported long-term and the even numbers will. Um, I'll have to verify that, but I think that's how it works. They're gonna do it basically how Node works so that people who are familiar with that will be familiar with how Angular releases are gonna work going forward. But let's uh, come back to ASP.NET Core real quickly here. So we'll see .NET new. And this time we'll say, MVC, which will create us a web application. And let's open that up in code. So I'll type code dot to go back into Visual Studio Code. That's taking a second to open. Okay, so you'll notice that uh, this time, um, and it's probably not a shocker, uh, in an MVC application, there's more folders, more files. And let's, let's just kind of do a flyover of what this is. So uh, ASP.NET Core does use the MVC design pattern. So we have an idea of, well, we don't have any, any models yet in this application. So you won't see the M portion just yet. You will a little bit later when we develop our API. 
Um, but we do have a controller. That's the C in MVC. Um, controller is, is sort of, you can think of it as a coordinator. That's where, um, you know, when a request comes in, MVC hands off that request to the appropriate action method on a controller. And we'll, we'll, take a, we'll make that a little bit more concrete in just a second. So just kind of hold on to that thought. But you have a controller that, that, that works with a request and then ultimately um, renders a view. And so you'll notice that we have a views folder over here and inside of the views folder, we have some other folders and then we have these CSHTML files. Well, these are Razor files or what we call Razor. So that's R-A-Z-O-R. Um, and this is simply just the, the template syntax that ASP.NET Core and prior to that ASP.NET MVC uses. We won't be using this a lot because we're going to just be creating an API. Um, so an API doesn't really have a visual component. It's just gonna be delivering data for our Angular application. But this app that we created using the template out of the box, um, it's just a server side rendered simple website. In fact, let's just, let's go ahead and build our restore and build our application just so you can see what this app looks like and what it does. So we'll do a .NET restore. You always have to do a restore before you can build and run. Remember, this is fetching packages. It's downloading packages. Okay, so now we have our packages and now we can say .NET run. So while we're waiting for that to start up, um, Jay asked, what, was the diff what is the difference between Angular and Angular 2? Um, so uh, quite a bit, actually. So Angular, which used to be referred to, well, I think it's fair to say that the previous version, so what we think of as Angular 1.0, is actually referred to as uh, Angular JS. So um, we had... And let me, uh, since we started on this tangent, <laughs> let me, let's, let's, let's go down this, this, this road a little bit. So I, I'm just going to pop over here in Visual Studio Code, uh, and I'll use this to kind of explain the progression here. So we had, this is sort of like my uh, uh, on, on the fly uh, PowerPoint here. <laughs> so we had AngularJS, which was, um, you could think of this as, uh, Angular 1.0, even though they really didn't call it that. It was a Angular JS was the name that people used, and, and that was out there for years. And they had different versions, right? So there was 1.0, there was 1.1, and then they went to 1.2, and so on. Up up to, I think, I think the latest version is 1.5 or 1.6, or maybe even 1.7. But in that time, while they're continuing to update Angular JS. They concurrently started working on a new version that they called Angular 2.0 because it was the next in the progression, right? As they were releasing these sort of incremental uh, updates to Angular JS, they were working on Angular 2.0. And notice they dropped the JS. Uh, Angular 2.0 can be used for a lot of different, like like you can use it for mobile app, native mobile applications. Um, they intend to to push into other areas. So they, they dropped the JavaScript off of it and just referred to it as Angular um, to try to uh, make the naming more broader. But Angular 2.0 took about two years um, from the time they announced it to when it was actually released to develop, so a long time. Um, and in that time, uh, well, one of the reasons why it took a long time was because it's a complete departure. It was a complete rewrite. They basically took everything they learned about AngularJS and said, how can we make this better? Um, we'll keep the things that work well, and we'll, we'll rewrite or completely rip and replace the parts that we don't like. Um, so it, it, even though it has the same name, it's a completely different animal. Um, and so this naming can be confusing. So I often think of the original version as AngularJS and the new version simply as Angular. And for a long, long time, we always said Angular 2. But um, in the last year, they announced that they're gonna switch to Simver and new releases are gonna start coming a lot faster. You're not gonna have to wait two years for the next version. In fact, they recently shipped uh, Angular 4.0. And we're going to see, um, I think it's quarterly. We're gonna see new releases on a quarterly basis. 
Um, so the number is going to keep going up. You know, we're going to see a 5-0, a 6-0, a 7-0. Um, it's going to move ahead a lot quicker. But don't worry about that. The jump from Angular JS to Angular was huge and significant. Um, like I said, they're like completely different frameworks. Whereas these jumps from two to four to five, six, seven, and so on um, are going to be much more incremental. There'll be new features when they do a major version, um, but it's not going to be a complete rewrite, a complete departure from from what how Angular two or Angular four works today. Um, nor will you have to wait two years in between. Uh, in terms of like like uh, broad strokes, like what, what's the difference? Um, Angular JS was very MVC um, structured. You know, you you had controllers and and you had you know templates that that you could think of as views. Um, so that was you know the way that you thought of your application and the design of it. Uh, Angular 2.0, like React, now is just component based. You write components. Components can have child components and so on, but your entire application is built um, using components. So at, a, at, at the 30,000 or 60,000 foot view, it's all about components now. Um, that, that's how I would describe the difference between Angular JS and Angular. All right, enough of that impromptu uh, <laughs> uh, slideshow there. Let's, let's go back to our, uh, MV, our simple MVC app. Uh, we are running. So right before I went on that tangent, um, we did .NET run down here and we're now let me just zoom in on that so .NET run and we now uh, are running on localhost port 5000 so if we go back to our browser and do localhost 5000 And there we go. Let me zoom in. So this is our fabulous uh, MVC project based upon the template that comes out of the box. Um, pretty simple, but we get a little bit of bootstrap styling here. We have a home page, we have an about page, and a contact page. Um, so not a lot going on here, but but it starts if you are unfamiliar with MVC or ASP.NET Core, you can kind of use that as a jumping off point to look at how the project is organized and how the code is written. Um, so it, it's, it's, a it's a decent starting point. We're actually going to uh, create an API. So uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna have this visual component. Um, our API is just gonna return data. So let's talk about then what that data is going to be. And we'll actually um, let me look at the time check here. Oh, and the room lights just went out. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, uh, motion sensor on the wall. That was awesome. So we're half an hour in. Let's, um, let's do this. Uh, we're going to talk about, well, let's just chat in real time here about what, what our API could do. So this is just going to be a simple uh, CRUD. API, so you know it's gonna. We're gonna be able to create records, read records, read or retrieve, update and delete. Um, our data really could be anything. Um, oh, so the uh, uh, someone just asked, uh, what are we coding? We're gonna be coding an ASP.NET API, and we're going to have an Angular front end that's going to call into that and display some data in the browser. Uh, so ASP.NET Core and Angular. And we're going to talk about, well, what is our ASP.NET Core API going to work with? Um, and it's going to just provide some simple um, CRUD functions. Um, what could we work with? I don't know. Let's pick something. Uh, so when I do courses here at Treehouse, I often do applications that work with uh, comic books data. Um, so we could certainly do that, though that might, for me, get a little boring because that's what I seem to do all the time. <laughs> um, so, but we could do movies, we could do books, uh, we could do video games. Um, we could really center it on anything. Uh, if someone has a suggestion for something they'd like to see, go ahead and shout it out uh, in the chat and we'll just start building our data model 
um, based upon that. Now, going back to like, what is our app going to do? Again, it's going to be an, an API, so it'll be a, uh, a REST API or a web API. So we'll say REST or, you know, I'm not going to follow. Um, it's interesting. People, I think, kind of throw around the word REST um, or RESTful APIs um, when they really probably mean web APIs. Um, so there's going to be aspects of, of a REST API in here, but I'm not going to like bend over backwards to adhere to the RESTful spec, if you will. Um, so if you're familiar with that, um, you, you may see some things that you're like, oh, you know, that, that may or may not be what you would expect. Um, that's fine. You know, we're, we're building a simple application and we could always continue and work and improve it. But I, I tend to think of these more as web APIs um, because they're HTTP based. Um, and we're going to sort of borrow and steal the parts of a RESTful API that, that we like. Um, so we're going to have uh, a method to, to get a single item, which will pass in uh, an ID of a record. We'll have a, a get method to get a list of items. So this, this will be a single record. Uh, get will return list of records. And then we'll have uh, a create. That will, of course, add a record. Uh, we'll have a, uh, well, here, let me let me use the right verbs here. So this, this will be a, so if we have a post, so get post, that's the HTTP, HTTP verb that we'll use. Uh, push will be uh, update a record. And then we'll have uh, delete. which will be, of course, delete a record. Uh, we'll start with working with um, uh, with data in memory, um, and then uh, given time and sort of like where we want to go with it, we could certainly um, use uh, well, Entity Framework Core, which is um, the ORM, the Object Relational Mapper that we use in .NET Core uh, to work with data. Um, so we could spend some time and, and spool that up, or Probably what we'll do is we'll just start with, with in-memory data. And from the outside, from the client side, it won't know any different. It's just going to work with our API and the data, whatever we, we, we change or add will disappear in between us restarting the server. Um, probably not a big deal for the time being because we'll just leave our server running so it will look and feel like we're actually persisting the data. Um, and then if we have time, we can persist it or we can do that in a follow-up session. But we'll start with just simple in-memory data. And then uh, we'll build an Angular client. Um, and we'll probably not get, I mean, just because of the time that we're working with today, uh, we're not going to get super far on there. I'll be happy if, if we can have a, a list screen that will, when it's loaded, we'll actually call our API and bind some data onto a template and display it. So that, that will be the goal. We're going to create an ASP.NET Core API with um, some basic methods. And maybe we even just start with, with Git, uh, the, the Git list. We'll move that to the top of the list. That will be our, that, we'll do that first. In memory data, in memory data, we'll just return some some object literals, uh, and then we'll get the Angular client displaying that list, and then we'll we'll iterate on that and keep you know making it better as we get time. So let's start with getting our our list of records, and I'm going to say, uh, so let's see here. Um, B world, you ask, can you make any app you want in Ionic two? Um, you know, I'm not super familiar with Ionic 2. So Ionic 2, for those who aren't familiar um, with that, is a uh, framework that allows you to create mobile applications. Uh, to my knowledge, it's, it's whereas React Native, for instance, uh, allows you to use React to create native applications, um, this Ionic is, is a web view wrapped. So it's a native application, but it's basically displaying all of your content using a web view control. So it allows you to write web code, which as web developers, that's a really great thing because it's super familiar and we're comfortable there. Um, and what they do is they, they're very clever with using CSS styling to make all of the controls look like their corresponding native controls 
<clears throat> on iOS and Android and whatnot. Uh, so uh, B World asked, "Is like a dating app is doable?" Um, depends what you want to do with it, but but I would think that you could probably start there, um, and you're probably going to be able to go quite far using Ionic or any of those kinds of frameworks. Um, uh, it's not a bad way to start, and there's a lot of things like all your backend services that would be the same regardless if you're doing a native application or uh, a web-based you know technology like Ionic. So. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with native development, um, like writing iOS apps using Objective-C or Swift, or even Java on the Android side, or Kotlin, for instance, stick with what you know. Use, use your, your web dev skills and you know, play to that strength. And Ionic would be a great choice to, to get started and get building. Okay, so let's... Um... Let's go ahead and let's let's create a, a, a simple data model for video games and and we'll expand that um, you know as as we as we can or as we have time to. So let me let me save this this list here just so we can use it as a scratch pad. So I'm just gonna call this our uh, to do text. And coming back over to our, you know, uh, I created a, oh, my computer is really running slow right now, which is really awesome. Am I completely hung up now? Let's make sure that the stream is still going. Okay, it looks like we're still going, um, but yeah, my computer was, boy, was really struggling there for a second. All right, so um, we created our simple MVC application. Now let's go create an API app. Uh, you know what, let's just, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it, we already have our, uh, our MVC application. Let's go ahead and just modify that. There is an API template that we could use, um, but let's 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 make a couple of quick changes and see if we can just sort of hijack our. Uh, okay, here we go. And I'm quite zoomed in there. Let me zoom out a little bit. All right, so we have our home controller. Um, we eventually we can get rid of that. Let's go ahead and just keep it there for now, and and let's add our our API controller. So I'm going to add a new file to the controllers folder, and we'll just call this uh, API controller .cs. Um, well, actually no, let's let's not do that. Let's do video games, and so we'll call this video games controller .cs, and actually. Now that I'm thinking about it, we're going to be creating a web API controller, um, which to make a distinction between controllers that would be like returning visible content or content that would have views associated with it versus um, controllers that are working with JSON data, data that doesn't have uh, a view that's going to be rendered. I'm going to, I like to do this. This is completely optional, but I'm going to create an API controllers folder. And then I'm going to move my video games controller into that API controllers folder. And then just to kind of as a jumping off point, I'm going to select this, the text for the controller here. Copy that and come over to video games controller, paste that in. Um, we don't need, let's get rid of these methods. Those don't have uh, anything to do with our API controller. Let's change our namespace. 
Remember earlier I mentioned that namespaces tend to map to folders. Remember we're, we're now in a class in the API controllers folder. So let's change this to be web app.api controllers. And instead of home controller, we named our file video games controller. And for anyone who's done ASP.NET MVC development, um, and is familiar with web API um, that you would use um, along with MVC, uh, you're familiar with, with there was API, this idea of an API based controller and a regular based controller. Uh, in ASP.NET Core, there's just a single base controller now. So uh, we took, remember we, this controller base class came from the home controller that I copy and pasted over here. We don't need to change it. It's the same controller in ASP.NET Core, which is really great. Um, so now we need to get, um, some, some data. So let's, let's do this. Let's create another folder for our models. So I'm going to say models and that put it at the wrong level. I'm going to drag that out here to the root of our application. And then let's add a, another file to the models folder. And this one we'll just call video game.cs. And we'll put this in, a, in its own namespace. So we'll say namespace, and our app is called web app. And we're in the models folder, so we'll just use models. And then now we can say uh, public class video game. And we can now talk about, and I'll change from using two spaces to four spaces. Uh, configure tab size four, please. Excellent. Okay. So what do we want uh, to have as part of our model for a video game? Well, uh, we need some way of identifying individual records. So I'm going to add a public integer property that is named ID. And so each, each you'll see in a minute as when we create our, our data set, uh, each one of these records is going to get a unique ID, and we'll we'll just use we'll just use you know one two three four, and so on like this. All right. Um, so what else do we want to do here? So let's let's add a string, um, and we'll say that that a video game has a title. And let's see, we can do a date time, and we can say that that's the release date. Actually, let's change that. So not release date, but published on. And then uh, let's add another string property. And this one, let's, let's say that this is uh, platform. What else could we do? Uh, maybe that's a decent starting point and then we can easily add um, additional properties here. If you think of something that you want to add, go ahead and uh, chat me a message and we'll get it added in there. Otherwise, we'll start with this. We'll have just the one, the one class, the one model, and then we can expand it from here. Like for instance, instead of using a string, a string property for platform, that a platform could be its own model that would have information about that platform. But let's start with this, and then we'll come back over to our API controller, or our video games controller, excuse me. And now we're going to uh, simply return um, a list of these, a collection of these. So to do that, we need a collection first. So I'm gonna return null for just a second here. And then I'm going to create a new list. So we'll say var video games equals new list. And we want our list to be of type video game. And then we can 
add items to that, uh, we're probably going to need to add the namespace for our video game model. You can see the, the it, uh, Visual Studio Code doesn't seem to know anything about our, our model right now. Um, that would end up being a build error. So if we save this file and uh, build our project, so if we say uh, .NET build, uh, we should we should get an error. Yep. Oh, can't find date time. So over in video game, um, the first error that we got is date time cannot be found. Oh, uh, you know that happened because notice notice here that we have a using system. Using is uh, they, they, it's called a directive, and it's a way of basically you can think of them as importing namespaces. So we can come over to a video game and daytime again. Notice that that it's in in black here. All right, I'm going to pop over and been monitoring this this the stream here. So we need we need to to import the namespace or add a using statement for the namespace that date time is in. Um, so now if we say using system, then date time will be something that that we can then use um, because date time lives inside of the system namespace. So if we come back over to PowerShell again, .NET build. And we'll see, we should get past that error, right? Okay, so now we have a different error. Now it says the type or namespace name video game could not be found. And that was going back to um, my original comment that over in video games controller, we need to, to add a using directive for the, the namespace where this type for this class lives. So up here we would say, using web app dot oh is it models models right okay and now again if we do dot net build hopefully that's that's um that's the last of the errors yeah so someone was just asking me if there was a lot of lag um i think yeah my computer's struggling to keep up here with encoding so i'm going to jump over to my settings and see if i can reduce the quality or something All right, so I, I reduced my my uh, video bit rate down, and hopefully that helps um, with some of the lag time. So, uh, you guys, let me know in the chat if if you think that that might um, be better. So uh, there was a question in the chat here about uh, I have a personal project idea due on someday next week in my school. Can you please suggest me ideas for a web application I can do for a personal project? Um, wow, that's a really uh, wide open question. Um, I personally like to think about, uh, you know, uh, you know, web application. Well, it, it could be just about anything, right? So I'm assuming that that by web app you mean that you you need to work with data. Um, audio is fine. It's the video. Yeah, I lowered I lowered my video bit rate, so I'm hoping that that makes a difference. 
Yeah, it looks like it's still legging a lot. Um, so pick something that you like to work with. Um, so if it's, if it's, you know, uh, if you like playing video games, do like what we're working on here and, and do an application around video games. If you like to read books, do something around books. Um, maybe a, a time tracking application that allows you to track how you spend your time. Um, maybe it's an app, a to-do list applications are really popular that tracks a list of to-dos. Um, and there's so many things, maybe a recipe application, maybe you like to cook and you build an application that allows you to, to enter recip recipes. Um, there's just a lot of different things that you can do. So let's see here. Okay. I think, I think hopefully this is the video getting better guys. Let me know in the chat. Um, if that helped. Um, the video helped it stream a little bit. It looks like it's, uh, it is helping. So let me know if, if that helped out a little bit. All right. So, uh, getting back to our application now, our build has succeeded. So that's great. Now we can come back and, and we're creating our list. So let's, we use the new keyword and we can say, all right, thank you. Uh, someone just said it's good now. Appreciate that. <laughs> so we can say a new video game. And we can basically, like you can in JavaScript, we can instantiate or create a new object and then we can also set properties um, in line. So let me indent using spaces. Yes. Four. Thank you. Probably ought to change that globally, but when I'm doing JavaScript, I like two spaces, and when I'm doing C sharp, I like four. So there you go. All right, so we had an ID property. So we'll set the ID to one here. And then, uh, you know, let me make sure that I have my C sharp extension. So out of the box, Visual Studio Code um, doesn't know how to work with C sharp. You have to ins install an extension. Um, was checking to see if, am I getting IntelliSense here? We should be getting auto completion on our properties and I'm not seeing that it doesn't seem to be working. So let's, let's try this. Let's see if we can fix this. I'm going to go ahead and update the C sharp extension and which will, we'll have to reload this window. So let's reload that. Let's see if that makes a difference. Okay. Excellent. Actually, that, that looks like it did help. Um, we'll see if we get... No, still not getting... A list of properties though it is now installing another package here so maybe we'll yeah it's installing OmniSharp and OmniSharp is is a a service that enables what we call IntelliSense which is like a uh, steroid charge or super enabled okay so now it's running OmniSharp is running there we go. This is encouraging. So I'm, I'm hovered my mouse over the, the video game class name. And we're at least getting, oh, here we go. Uh, yes. So the Visual Studio now is recognizing that we're working with a C sharp file and it says required assets to building debug are missing from web app. Yes. Let's go ahead and add those. So it recognized that we were in a ASP.NET Core application. Um, oh yeah, now some things are starting to happen. Notice that we're getting reference counts. Um, and yep, there we go. So now if we hover over video game, we're getting information there. And let's try this. If we get rid of that property and start to type title, no. And of course it's still not gonna come up with a list of properties. Uh, that's weird. All right, well, we'll just continue on. So we'll call this, uh, we'll say Super Mario 64. 
And then we had uh, published on, I believe, was our date time. And we create, we can say new date time. And uh, so we are we are getting an uh, auto completion or IntelliSense um, on the built-in types. This is, for some reason, it's not recognizing the properties for our video game type, which is interesting. Maybe it's still catching up. So, uh, wow, I'm just gonna take a wild guess here. I think it was 1996. Um, and I'm just gonna put that in January 1st, which I'm sure that's not the right release date, but that's what we'll use for this case. And then over in video game, let me remind myself the properties that we had. Oh, platform. Uh, so we had ID, title, published on, and platform. So let's add our last property here. No, oh, I'm still not. I wonder if it's because of the syntax that I'm using for this um, object initialization syntax, maybe that's uh, confusing it. So uh, so the platform was in 64. Okay, so that's our first video game. Let's add one more. We'll add at least two so that we have, uh, technically it's a list then. It's not just gonna be a list of one. Uh, so we'll add ID two and let's see, we need another uh, how about resident uh, evil? And we'll just change the date. I have no idea when the first Resident Evil came out. Let's say it's let's let's say it's 1994, <laughs> and uh, we'll say that that platform oops platform was PlayStation. Okay. So now we have our list of video games, and then let's just return that collection that list from our controller action method. So return video games. Oh, and we're getting an error. Ah, so we have uh, an I action result as our return type, um, which is uh, represents, it's an interface that describes a result that you return from an action method, which is what we're in. We're in our index. And I'm gonna rename this. Index would be uh, the default action method name if we were inside of a controller that was going to return something visual like a page or a screen or an application. We're intending to de develop this as an API, so it's not gonna have a visual component. Um, so I'm just gonna name this uh, Git. And then we do need to, in order to make this work here, we do need to add some attributes, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that. Because we're gonna we'll, let's show it failing, and then we'll 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 come back and we'll fix it. So return, and then there's a method that we can call that will return an OK result. So an OK result from an API would have an HTTP status code of 200. And so I'm just gonna return my video games list from that. All right, oh, and there is the motion sensor and the light going off again. <laughs> if it's not one thing, it's another. So uh, so someone suggested in the chat that if, that if it was still struggling for you, just try refreshing, um, and it seems to be working for uh, everyone else. So give that a go if, if the stream is struggling. Um, thanks, Rayanne, for for making that suggestion. Um, Rahim, you're welcome. Um, said thanks for live coding, um, you're welcome. Glad to be doing this and hopefully you'll find it useful. Okay, so where are we at here? We have our video games controller, we, we have our Git, um, and we're returning okay, which is, that represents an, an HTTP status code of 200 is what we would expect okay or what uh, that is what okay is going to return um let's go ahead and build and run and just see if we can if we can browse to to this uh to this action and see what the result is going to be so i'll say dot net build And 
of any luck, we won't get any build errors. Okay, excellent, we're building. So now let's run our application. So we'll say .NET run. And once that starts up, we should see down here that it's serving on localhost port 5000. Yep, so there's localhost port 5000. And so if we switch over to our browser, localhost 5000. We didn't remove, um, just to recap, we didn't remove any of our existing uh, MVC application that we created from, from the, the available project template. So we should still see that bootstrap styled app once, once it loads up, okay? Um, so how do we get, how do we browse to our API method? So the name of our controller is video games controller. So the first part of the path by default, the way MVC uh, wants wants to address these is you would say video games. So you'd say slash video games, and then you would say slash get. But that's not exactly how we want this to work, but let's let's go ahead and, and at least hit that, hit that route, hit that controller and action method. And then we'll talk about, you know, ideally like how we want that to work. So if we say slash 5,000 uh, video games slash get. And we do get, we do get output here. So we get our data and notice that, that it's, it was, it's being converted to JSON for us. So this is negotiated content. Um, you know, that, that's the format that even though we, we didn't have to convert our data into JSON, um, ASP.NET Core is doing that for us. So we have our controller working, but there's a couple of tweaks that we need to do to this. We shouldn't, for one, we shouldn't have to specify the git uh, in our URL. Um, we should be able to, oh, dang it. The encoding overload us. I'm going to lower the bit rate again on the video and see if we can. Yes, um, Yusef, thanks for the heads up that it's. Sorry about this. Um, let me lower the bit rate one more time. Let's see if that helps. Okay, so I think that cleared again and let's, I'll give it a second to see if it catches up. Sounds like the audio is probably going through but the video um, was lagging and stopping again. Waiting for it to catch up here. Okay, looks like we're caught up again. Um, I'm going to, let's, let's do this. Let's go take a look at, so we're, what I was getting at here in in our URL, so right now we're, we're having to specify the path all the way to our, um, to our action method. So if we pop over back over to uh, Visual Studio Code, we had to reference this um, by name. We had to do uh, video games slash git. And what we really want to do is we want to tie that to the git HTTP verb. Um, because we ultimately what we're trying to get to is uh, once we get this initial git working is we want to be able to have methods here that would allow us to uh, post and put. So uh, if we did a post, we could do a put and we could do a delete as well. Um, so in order to, to make that happen and in our controller and ASP.NET Core, uh, we need to, 
my encoder is overloading again. So, uh, uh, Eden, you asked uh, when will there be live coding for Python. Uh, I'm assuming that Kenneth is going to be back next week, and he'll continue where he left off um, from the previous week. Uh, so we're on uh, a different topic today because Kenneth is at PyCon, I'm assuming having a great time. Um, so my name is James, and I'm doing ASP.NET Core and Angular today. Uh, and I think uh, Kenneth will be back next week um, and do some more Python. So let me see if I can free up some resources here. So I'm going to close this. I'm going to shut down that. Close that. Close that. And close magnifier. Let me close edge. Okay. So we're still said video encoding overload. So let me come back. Sorry for this guys, but let's make sure that this is actually going to continue to work and not keep freezing up. So let me adjust my settings one more time here. Okay, so hopefully that will um, that will continue to help. I'll keep an eye on that and keep letting me know in the chat if if it freezes in case I miss that that it's freezing again, and hopefully we can we can get this to to work well. Sorry about those technical difficulties. Okay, Kenneth's setup is rock solid. He's uh, he's been doing this for a while now and has worked out all the kinks. And I'm working on a new setup here in in the Treehouse office. And so clearly I had some, some settings that I needed to have different. Um, next time we'll get that all worked out and uh, we won't have these issues again. So thanks for your patience. Appreciate it. Okay, so getting back to what I was saying is we really want our, our controller to more, act more like a, a web API or RESTful controller and, and use the verbs, that the HTT verbs that are being sent as the request to know which of these action methods um, should should be like the one that is called, and we don't have to actually route using the path. So to do that, there's actually some attributes that we can put on these on these uh, on the controller, and we can put uh, one on the action method itself as well. So we have a route attribute. I don't remember what is the property name here. Oh, that's a tremendously huge long list. Uh, let's see here. Is it rude? You know, I forget what this is. So I'm going to go. Let's go look this up. So let's do ASP.NET Core uh, Web API Controller. And I forget what the property is that, uh, so we'll go take a look at the docs. Are we in the right place? Yeah, I believe we are. So, oops. Okay, looking here. Okay, so we are making sure that, that, that uh, and wow, really getting poor browser performance here. I wonder if it's Chrome actually that was um, taxing my system. And now we're getting another video encoding overload. This is so, so annoying. <laughs> so let me see here. You know, I'm going to look at my system resources to see if I can figure out what is causing 
so much of a strain on my system here. All right, it's definitely not Chrome. It's just, it's OBS. The streaming software that we're using is just really taxing things. So, okay, so we are using ASP.NET Core. This is the documentation for that. I just wanted to make sure that that, in fact, was the right thing that I was looking at there. And then what I'm looking for is okay, we've added our model class. Yeah, that's all good. Um, we need to. We're not doing, we're not persisting our data to a database. So that's not what we're looking for either. Okay. So, okay. So I was on the right path. So it's route for the attribute on the controller and you specify the path um, to that. So let's go ahead and add that bit. And so we just pass in a string into the route attribute. And an attribute is a way of, of adding metadata to classes, methods, properties. In Python, I think they have decorators that, that do similar, similar things. Um, so I can say route and I can then say API and then um, we can pass in a token. So I can use this controller token and whatever the name of my controller is, is what's going to get substituted in here. So in this case, uh, it would be video games. So API slash video games. Then here we can say we can add another attribute. And we can say that, that this is, and we don't, you could use, you can leave the attribute at the end of the name, but we can also just shorten it and take the attribute off. That will get added, added there by default or automatically for us implicitly. So we can say that that is going to be a git. Uh, and I think that's all we need to do. So let's, let's build our application again. Okay, we're still running. So I'll press control C to stop the server. Come on, control C, there it goes, it's shutting down. So let's, um, let's build and then let's run and let's see if we get, if we're able to, to just browse without having to specify the action method. That's what, that's what we're trying to get to here. So .NET run and wait for the server to start up here. Okay, we're running again. Let's come back over here. And let's, so now we're, we're saying it's uh, localhost 5000 slash video games with no slash git. And we'll hit that. Oh, and it can't be found. Oh, this localhost page cannot be found. Oh, it's because I changed over in for the controller. I said that it was gonna be API slash controller. So I forgot to add the API. So if we say API slash video games. Ah, and there we go. There is our wonderful video game data. And if we uh, open up the web dev tools, let's take a look at the response itself. Make this a little bit bigger. Let me adjust some of these sections down here. Excellent. And let's go to network. And we'll just we'll refresh this to capture the request. Okay. Headers. Now well, let me keep expanding this section here. Response headers, request headers. Okay, so we're getting a status code of 200. That's good. Okay, here's what I was looking for. So uh, content type we can see is application slash JSON. Uh, that's great. That's what we wanted. Perfect. So now we're hitting our API. Um, okay, well, that's a starting point. What else can we do? So real quickly, let's... 
let's add one more method. Well, let's add a couple of methods. Now, now that we're, we're kind of getting a, a, a roll here, or on a roll here, let's, in fact, I'm gonna make a slight change to how we're, we're setting up our in-memory data. Let's move this var video games from being a local variable, and we'll move it up out of that method into the class so that it can be, and, and we'll make it, we'll make it static uh, so that it's available globally, if you will. Um, so, so let's see here, we'll save, and we don't use var anymore. Let's make this a, and we'll, we'll still for the time being make it private. So we'll say private, uh, and this is gonna be a list uh, video game, and then we'll give it a name, underscore video games. I like to give my private fields, or start name them for an underscore, just so that they're really obvious in the code, uh, what that is, and then we'll say uh, private static. Oh, and I put this <laughs> in the wrong place. Uh, I moved it, I was so aggressive with moving it, I moved it outside of the class, which is not what we want. So let's put it just inside of the class because we want it to be a field for, in the class and let's fix this indentation uh, in the video stream just overloaded again. You know, the resolution still looks pretty good. I'm gonna keep cranking down the uh, the video quality and let's see if we can get this to behave. Okay, I aggressively lowered it that time. <laughs> let's see if that makes a difference. Okay. So we have now a private static list of video games under, called underscore video games. Um, now we should be able to then, because it's static, there's only gonna be one instance of it um, associated with our controller. And then down here, we can uh, return, it's not video games, but underscore video games. Okay. Excellent. Now let's add, this is gonna also, let's add another method. So that's, this is also gonna be an HTTP get, and this will be a public, and we'll return I action result again. And except this time, we're going to add a parameter. So instead of our original get method was returning the entire list, this time we'll, we'll we're gonna filter it. So we'll do, we'll, we'll find the video game that references. So we'll say video game, and then we'll say underscore video games uh, where, and then now we can write, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with C Sharp, um, there's a part of C Sharp called Blink, uh, which is language integrated query. And this allows us to, uh, Conveniently, uh, when working with collections, we can uh, filter, for instance. So where is, is a basic filter. So we can say where video game dot ID equals the ID that we're being passed. And then we can say uh, we want, we should only find one that matches that. So I'm gonna say single or default. There's also first or default, which would return the, the first um, matching the first true case, the first instance that matched, but we're gonna say single, which single will throw an exception if more than one is found. And then uh, for now, let's assume that that we find a matching, which is probably not what we're always gonna to wanna to do. Um, so we'll add a to-do here, uh, return uh, 404, 404 HTTP status code if uh, video game is not found. And then let's re do a return. And we can call this this okay helper, helper method and just pass in then the video game that we found. And let's add one more here. Uh, let's do a post. So this one will be HTTP post this time for the attribute. Still a public method. Wow. 
man, the, the encoder keeps complaining, just keeps complaining. You know, the video quality, again, still looks decent, so I'm going to keep cranking this down. <laughs> I'm going to say, let's move this down to 600. Okay. All right, so let's say I... I action result is our return type. And then uh, this is for a post. So just just even though the, the name of the method um, doesn't really matter, we could we could name it we could name it test, we could name it uh, dog, we could name it whatever we want to name it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and name it post just so that it's really clear that this is a, a method on our controller that's gonna handle the a post HTTP verb. And then um, we can leverage a feature in ASP.NET Core called model binding. And so we can actually make um, the post data that's gonna be sent to us as part of the request, um, we can have it model bind directly to our model. So we can say we want our parameter to be of type video game, and we'll just name it video game. And then down here, what we'll do is I'll say, hey, if, Video game, just we'll, for, we'll check to make sure that it's not null. Um, and then we'll go ahead and say video games, well, underscore video games dot uh, add. And so then we'll add that, that video game that was just posted to us to our static collection. And then uh, we, don't, we don't need to return, uh, let's see, so we can return, and I forget, yeah, so we have created as a, as a, as a method that we can call. Oh, uh, created doesn't take zero arguments. What does it want? Let's take a look here. Uh, hello, auto completion. No, oh, it's not helping me out here. Oops, it was just taking a second to get there. Ah, so it wants the created method that I'm trying to call is looking for a string URI where the content was created. Um, and then we can return the value as well. So let's come back here. And so we can we can return that string. Uh, and then we'll we'll go ahead and return the video game itself as well. So where this is gonna be located then, um, you know, what, one thing that we're not handling here is we need a way to assign the ID. Well, when we're first testing here, I'm going to, I'm going to get set the ID manually, which is totally not the way to do this. ID should be a concern of the API, not the person who's posting the data. So let's add that as another to do, uh, set, set the ID value. And there's, there's a hack, there's a way. Again, keep in mind, we're not using a database. We're just kind of faking this in here for the time being. So we, want, we don't want to get too hung up on this implementation because when we, when we switch to using uh, an actual data, a database for our data persistence, um, things like setting the ID would be a responsibility of the database, the table in the database to give us a new ID. So we wouldn't have to write the code to do that. So we're having to do a workaround for the time being. So where this is going to be located, it's going to be slash API. Um, and then uh, let's see, it would be video games. And then it would be the ID. So video game dot ID. Because that would be that would be the route to the individual video game. And we'll, and we'll see what that that looks like. So well, let me type out the comment here. So what we want that to look like is, you know, if we're running on localhost 5000, then it would be API video games. And then whatever the ID is, let's imagine that the ID for that record is one. So that's what our URL would look like. Okay, so let's go ahead and run with that. Um, so what we wanna be able to do is, is make sure we're still getting our list back we wanna make sure that we can pass in an ID and get a single record back. 
and then we want to see if we can actually post and and add to the collection so that when we call get again we're getting <clears throat> excuse me we're we're seeing our new record added on there now to we could we could potentially keep using uh, Chrome to do this, but it makes it a little bit harder, especially when you start doing post requests. So uh, let's let's launch Postman, which Postman makes it a breeze to be able to test APIs. So I'm going to go do do a .NET run and wait for the server to start up. Um, our project is building, I, I'm pretty sure the .NET run, I, I'm out of habit, I always do a build and run. Yeah, you know what, I don't think it built. So let's let's make sure that we're building because we made changes. We want to capture those changes and then we'll do a run. And once we ver use Postman to verify the behavior here, we're going to switch over to the Angular CLI and see if we can get an application then to call our API and display a list of our video games. So that's where we're going very soon here. So hang in there. If you're waiting to see the Angular bits, um, we're almost there. Okay, Postman. Where are you at, Postman? Oh, we're on screen somewhere. Hmm. Okay, here we are. This is Postman. And so now we can make a Git request. So let's put in the right URL here. So it's localhost 5000, and then it's API, because that was the, the, the base path, if you will, that I added to the API controller. And then we'll say video games. And then we'll send that request. Oh, and we got an unhandled exception. <clears throat> Ah, so we have two git methods. Um, so MVC basically is telling us, hey, we don't, we don't know which one of these git methods should be the one to call. So we need to go fix that. And so we need to actually add another route attribute then to the one that takes an ID and specify how this route should be different from, from the route of the other git method. So we'll say route. And I think, if I remember correctly, um, we only have to specify, um, we, can, we can only, we only have, since we're defining the route attribute on the action method, we only have to supply the part of the path that's, that's specific to this, and I, and I think it's curly braces and then ID. Let's jump back over to the documentation just to verify that real quickly. Oh, oh, you know what? I forgot about that. So you can actually do it right in the verb now. You don't have to, to do the route attribute, though I think that works as well. So uh, this is a shortcut that's available to us now in ASP.NET Core. We can just say HTTP get and then curly braces ID. And I think that should be enough. Uh, I don't think our post, our post is fine because it's just going to be post to slash API slash video games. Uh, so let's go ahead and give that another go. So we'll build and run this again. Fun. Hi, thanks for joining us. And then let's run. Okay, we're running on localhost 5000. And then let's come over to Postman and we'll just send our request again. Ha ha, and there we go. Excellent. Oh, I can zoom in here. Excellent. I'll make that a little bit easier to see on the stream. Sorry that that took me a, a minute to to remember to zoom in there. Let's keep going in. Let's make this. Uh, I maxed out the zoom there. Okay, so to localhost five thousand slash API slash video games. Um, this is a GET request, and we sent that, and we get our data back. Let's now try our single record, 
So if we do a slash one, meaning that we would expect to only get back the ID uh, or the record that has an ID of one, there we go. And we get back our first record, Super Mario 64. Let's do a slash two. There's our second record, Resident Evil. Excellent. And now let's do a post request. So we can change in Postman, you click on that little drop down and you say post. We need to change our URL. We don't need an ID anymore. Um, we'll specify that in our model. And I'm gonna grab this because that JSON that's coming back is what we want our body, our post body to look like as well. So we're posting to API slash video games uh, type. Yeah, we don't have any auth. Um, we want, yes, JSON is good. We want to put this in our body and let's change this to be raw and we'll use JSON application. And then I'm gonna post this in here, but I'm gonna tweak again. Remember, ideally we want our API to be setting uh, the ID value here, not the person who's sending the data. Um, but let's go ahead and, and roll with it. Uh, so we need another game title. Uh, how about we do Halo? We'll give a Microsoft platform some love here. And then let's let's we'll just leave that date formatted like that, and we'll bump this up to I don't know. I think it was might have been a little earlier than that. I can't remember. And then we'll it was on the original Xbox. Okay, so we're gonna post this JSON data to API slash video games, and let's see if we get a response back. Did anything happen? So let's see here. So send. Hmm. Okay. No. So let's let's now do a let's do a git. I don't think this is working. Something. Something doesn't feel right here to me. Let's double check what I'm doing here. Uh, send params, no, post. We still running? Yep, we're still running. Okay. Ah, you know what? I think it was just my mouse was not clicking well or something. So we sent that. Ah, and look at that. Now we're getting a status of 201 created back. Sweet. And if we come over here, oh, that's interesting though. We're, we're getting the data that's coming back is just an empty object. Um, so it's acting like our post data didn't, our mapping to our video game entity didn't work like we expected it to. So let's, let's do this. Let's do a request to send yeah, look at that. So um, our post, uh, we, we, we got the data, um, but our model binding isn't working. Uh, it did, did not come over in the format that we expected, but the ad was successful, so that's interesting. So let's pop over here and see. Uh, you know, I wonder if it's because, let's go take a look at the documentation. I feel like I'm doing something probably a uh, very simple uh, mistake here. Let's see if they have an example of doing a post. Okay, here we go. Oop, man, performance is really lagging right now. Yep. Okay, so we have HTTP post, create, and then from body to do. So let's add that from body and see if that resolves our binding issue. Not boldly, from body. Okay. I think we're still running. So let's stop the server. Let's build. Remember, since we were stopping and starting the server, we just have in-memory data. So we're, our collection will be reset 
back to what it was before, just with our two items. So we'll have to repeat our post. Look, luckily, Postman makes that really easy to do because it remembers our requests that we, the history of our requests, so we can replay those. So if we come back over to Postman, let's just do a get on our collection again. Yep, we're back to our original two items that we're, that we're you know, in, initializing our collection with. And then over here, we can select post. And again, if we go look at our body, we're trying to post an ID three, Halo. Let's send that. Okay. Ah, look at that. That looks much, much, much better. Now we're getting back the data that we actually sent. So this, this is looking good. And again, we're getting a created status code. Now, again, if we do a get, boom, there we go. Now we're seeing three. Let's, let's add one more just for kicks. So if we come over here, body, and let's change our ID to four. And then let's see, we need another, another. Uh, how about, I'm a big Nintendo fan. So let's say Mario Kart 64. And then we'll bump this to, again, no idea what year. <laughs> Certainly not on Xbox though. So we'll say N64. And then let's send that. Excellent. And we get our 201 created in the data back here. Let's do another get. There we go. And we've got four items. So that is great. Um, we don't have um, our put, our up, which would allow us to do updates, and we don't have deletes, but that's okay. We'll, we'll leave it alone for now um, and move on to creating an Angular application and see if we can make a request and display this data. We got 20 minutes to do that. Uh, so we're going to have to kind of go through that fast, but, but let's see what we can do. So we need a place to put our source code for our Angular application. Um, our Angular app is going to have its own source files. So our ASP.NET Core application has a set of C# -sharp files. We also still have these views. We could delete all this stuff now because what we were what we were really trying to go for is our. In fact, let's just do that because we we don't want to confuse the issue and have a home controller and we'll just get rid of that folder because it's now empty. So we're doing a little cleanup here. We're going to leave our models. That's, that's where our video game model was at. Um, and we don't need any of the stuff that's in the views folder because that was all part of that MVC um, project that was created from, from the template. And so we're going to delete that. We didn't talk about www root. Let's talk about what this www root folder is. So with ASP.NET Core, www root, that is the actual public folder. That's, that's the folder where all of our web content is actually getting served out of. When we build our application uh, and we are, are serving and running our application, then ASP.NET Core um, basically will surface our views off of www.root and all of our controller code, all of that, the, the C-sharp code that we're writing gets compiled into a binary and execute, uh, an executable. Um, and, and that code can be, can be then ran on the server. And then you'll notice in www.root is all of our static files. So it's like our, our CSS, we have images, we have some JavaScript in here that we can reference. So when we're, building our angular client we're going to want our the client files themselves to be put into this folder now we can all of this content that was here before was part of that that again that template that we used to create the mvc so i'm going to clear this out just so that we don't have any collisions when we start to put together our our angular application so i'm going to get rid of images i'm going to get rid of this this javascript because we're not we're going to start from scratch there. Uh, the lib folder, okay, so that has bootstrap, jQuery. I'm just going to get rid of all that as well. So again, so we don't have any odd collisions when we do our Angular. So now we're down to almost an empty www root uh, folder. It has a fav icon. That's the only thing that's left in there. Um, great. So let's do this. Let's make a folder for our... Actually, when we use the Angular CLI, it's going to want to create the folder for us. 
So let's hold off on doing that, but let's go to the, the documentation for the CLI. And that is, you can just Google Angular CLI or you can do cli.angular.io. And they have instructions here about how to get started. Uh, to install the CLI, um, you typically install it globally. So you would do an npm install, let me make this a little bigger, an npm install dash g at angular slash CLI. I've already done that ahead of time, so I have that installed. Then the ng command is what you use to create a new application. So you can say ng new and then the name of the app. So let's go ahead and do that. We're currently already in the root of our project. So this would be a fine place, I think, for the time being. There's different ways you could do this. We could go up a level. Um, so in outside of the folder that has all of these ASP.NET Core API files, we could go up a level and put our application there. Um, actually, you know what? Let's, let's do that. So we'll go up. So now we're at the same level where our web app folder is. And so we'll do ng new, and then we're going to call this, uh, let's see. So we'll call this client app. And again, when we run the ng new command, it's going to create a folder. So I named the, basically the name of the app will become the name of the folder. So client app is the folder. Um, it's now created a bunch of files as we, as we can see here on screen. That's what all this stuff is. Um, it's also installing packages now. So it's using NPM behind the scenes to go grab all of the packages that we need um, to, to have our uh, Angular application actually be runnable. Excuse me. That takes, as you can see, a little bit to do. So as we're waiting for that, um, let me describe in a little bit more detail here, like what we're going to do here. We're going to, once this is done creating, we'll go ahead and, and, and start our application and show it's running, running in the browser. And then we'll need to make sure that we can get our this application over into the www root folder of our API so that when we start our API, we're serving our Angular application along with it. One of the advantages of having our Angular application served from the same web app as our API is we won't have to worry about whether or not um, we need to enable cross-origin requests. So uh, by default, unless the API is configured to support it, which ours isn't out of the box, though ASP.NET Core uh, Web APIs certainly support it, we just need to add that configuration in, um, wouldn't allow requests outside of their domain. So making a request from uh, an Angular client application that's, that's hosted from a different domain, even a different port, over to the API, um, we should get an error if we were to try to do that. By publishing our Angular application into the www root folder of our ASP.NET application, they will, they'll both be being served from the same server from the same domain and port number. Um, so that should be completely allowable and, and will make it, um, uh, make it a little bit easier to set up. And so that's where we'll start. Um, why would you want to keep them separate? Uh, and I'm noticing here that uh, while the NPM packages are being downloaded, I think it's saturating the, the, my, my broadband, my bandwidth, and the video is lagging again. So we got a bit of a, almost like, it feels like a race condition here as we're downloading NPM packages and trying to stream video at the same time. So while we're waiting for that to kind of clear here, let me um, talk a little bit about pros and cons of, of Angular in a same app versus separate app. Uh, again, same app makes it a little bit easier because you're having both your client side application and your backend API are being served from the same domain. It just makes it a little bit easier, um, less configuration to do on the API, the server side. 
Um, most technologies that, that, that you would use to write APIs, though, are going to allow you to configure um, what we call CORS, C-O-R-S, for cross-origin requests. Um, so it's not that it's like tremendously difficult to do. It's just another step that you would have to do in the process. Um, wow. Okay. So this is really struggling right now. So that would be that would be a pro or a benefit of keeping them in the same directory. It's just, just that it's simple. Um, what's a con? Well, you, you could end up, you know, even though we're going to be able to keep our source separate, um, you kind of have things co-mingling. Um, it's probably not the worst thing in the world. Um, but if you really want to think of your APIs being its own separate project, uh, then you might want to keep them really completely separate and, and, you know, think of them as separate applications, then that could be a reason why you would even serve them from different, from different websites. So it really kind of boils down to how you want to organize your code. And how I think you like you want to work basically. You know, how, how do you how do you imagine your team working together? How do you do you want to think of them as separate applications or do you want to think of them as being all of the same? Okay, so waiting here. Okay, I think looks like maybe the video is starting to catch up. Uh and NPM, we're, we're still waiting for things to download. All right, so what else can I talk about about Angular? So once we get, once this fi finishes initializing, and hopefully it does uh, finish initializing here, um, so that we can move on to the next part. That would be really disappointing <laughs> if I can't even get the NPM packages to download. Um, is we're going to test running the application using in, the ng serve command. And then we're going to um, basically, those, there, there'll be an app component, one component in our application. We're going to want to Ah, okay, finally, <laughs> it finally cleared. Okay, so here we go. So nice that it finally got around. So let's let's go into our client app folder and then let's do ng serve. The Angular CLI uh, uses Webpack for uh, the module bun bundling within an Angular application. So one of the things we're going to see it do here is as it's starting up the server uh, is that it's going to bundle our application. And we should, with any luck, see its success message once it's through bundling here. Almost done. Okay, excellent. So here are the files that it generated. So we have polyfills, we have main, styles, vendor, inline, and then now we're running. So if we go to localhost 4200, we, sure, we should see our amazing, I'm sure it's gonna be amazing. Actually, it's not gonna be amazing at all. Uh, but let's, let's go see it running. So localhost 4200, Loading and there we go. App works. <laughs> so let's let's move that over there and then let's I'm gonna stop that and then I'm gonna open into code, Visual Studio Code, our application, the Angular application now, and then I'm gonna start ng serve again. And then while that is starting up, we'll come over to Visual Studio Code. We'll go side by side here. So I wanted to show off that, that one of the cool things that Angular CLI does is it, it watches your files. Okay, and the server is starting up. And now we're bundling again. Uh, so everyone's view asked, how do you secure the API with respect to access to user roles? Um, so to be clear, um, in the current, the way we we're, we're currently set up our API, there was absolutely no security at all. Um, anyone, if this was 
published publicly. Anyone could just browse to it and, and get to it. Um, usually people use uh, ASP.NET Identity, um, which is a library that you bring into your ASP.NET Core application that allows you to add authentication to your app. Um, when you do that, you can use a variety of, of authentication um, methods, if you will, um, including OAuth or OpenID. And then once you have that, then your users are authenticated. Then you can start to get information about your users, like their email address, or maybe, you know, like if you're writing an application for a company, um, what groups or what roles. Um, and then from there, you can basically start to apply that security to your ASP.NET Core application and say, hey, this user is trying to do this. Should they be allowed to? And then you can then you can ask those kinds of questions in your code. That'd be a great topic for a future live coding is to basically take our simple application, add OAuth to it, and then add the idea uh, of, of an admin user or user role and put certain users in there and have certain users not be. That'd be a really cool way to do it or our cool live coding. So now we have our, our ng serve is running again. Let's go in and make a simple change to our application. Here's my app inside of the source folder. We have an app folder and inside of there, we have a set of files for the one component that is in our application. So we have uh, four files. There's an app component.ts. So this is the, the JavaScript, actually it's TypeScript, our TypeScript for our app component. We have a spec, which is a set of unit tests. So it's pretty cool that it, that out of the box, it wrote unit tests for our component. We have an app component HTML file, which is the template. And you can see that it's super simple, though we can play around with that and see how it changes. And then we have an app component.css, which is currently empty. So let's go in and our component right now, if we look at our template, and let me, let me zoom in on this a little bit. It's using interpolation here to do the binding. So this curly brace, curly brace title, this is, this is grabbing whatever value of that title property on the component and, and rendering that uh, to our view. So if we go look at our component, we can see that our, our app component is just a class and it has a title property. And if we update this and save, Notice over here on the right, the the the, the Angular CLI server, um, which I believe is delegating down to uh, the Webpack server, is watching the file system. Notice that we made a change, rebundling our application and refreshing the browser for us so that we can see our latest change. So that makes it really great when you're working over in the Angular side or Angular world as you're making changes. You don't have to keep refreshing the browser manually. If you have a second monitor, you can put that over on a second monitor. And as you're writing code, you can just see the effects of what you're doing. So that's pretty slick. So we have a super, super basic um, application with one component, our app component. Um, and we can switch back over to our template. And so let's make a change to our template. Uh, what do we want to do? Oh, let's let's add let's add an H two. And if we save that, then we should see it load, and there it is. We can just write static literal HTML and our template, and of course it's gonna display, we could add additional properties to our component. So for instance, if we, let's see, let's do this. If we added a video games property here and made it an array, and then if we added, um, let's add a title, we'll just put titles in here for the time being. 
oops, <laughs> need to, to finish my, my transition here to uh, JavaScript from C Sharp. So let's, we'll add a couple here and then we'll update our template to bind to that and display. And then uh, once we once we get that working, then we'll add the API call and see if we can get the data over. So this was Super Mario 64, and then Resident Evil. Okay, and then over in our template, let's do this. Let's. Uh, how do we want to to render this? Let's let's do it in an unordered list. That's probably not the way to do it, but <laughs> that's the way that I'm going to do it right now. Excellent. And then we'll do a star in G4. And we'll say, uh, I, forget, I, think it's, I think it's let. So let video game in video games. And then inside of here, we can do our binding syntax. Oops. And then we can say video game dot title. Save that. Ah, okay. So I think we broke. So I think I don't think that was the right syntax. So let's let's see what the error is that we're getting back in the console here. Oh yeah, hey, look at that. Okay, so it's not finding. So let's let's go let's go check that out. Let's go see. I'm clearly making a mistake. I, I thought I could uh, remember how that worked, uh, and I didn't. So let's go verify what that looks like. So over in Angular.io, we can go to the docs, and let's see here. Now let's go to advanced, and let's go check out. No, it's not under advanced. Uh, guide template syntax. That sounds promising. And then ng4. Okay, so ng4 let hero of heroes. Oh, so it's not in, it's of. <laughs> so let's let's fix that at least, because I know that is absolutely wrong. Ah. And there we go. So I just, I got it mixed up. It's not in, it was of. So let's talk about what I just did there. Uh, we have an unordered list. And then I had the single li uh, element. And then I added a star ng4, which the star then indicates that this entire element then that I'm putting the attribute on, that this becomes our, our template, if you will. This is what we're going to use as, as each item each video game of video games is iterated through, it uses this as the template. So we can we can put whatever content we want in here. So for instance, I could say title and then bind to video game dot title and there we get our list. So that, you know, and we could add additional bindings in here um, and add additional, you know, um, properties or render additional properties, but we'll start with the title. And so the one thing that we're missing now is, uh, well, just a couple of things going on here. One, we're just running this from within our source folder. So we actually need to get this code over to our API so that when we browse to the root of our ASP.NET Core project, we see this page, which will allow it to successfully make a call to the API. Because if we tried to call the API now, um, we should get a cross domain origin error if we were to do that. So we need to now figure out how do we call over into our API. And there is um, some lifecycle events that I think we can tap into. And it's been a little while since I've done this. So we're gonna need to, we're gonna need to go look this up. So, and I'm gonna run over time-wise a little bit, but I really wanna be able to make this API call and uh, close the loop here. So let's, let's say Angular 2, uh, call API. Let's just see if we can find something here. Uh, client. Let's let's see what what this what this article says. 
done this. It's been a little while since I've done it. So let's I'm just looking for the basic. Uh, so here they're creating a service. We don't need to go that far. Um, but we do we do need the HTTP service. So let's let's do that. Let's import HTTP and response from Angular HTTP. So that um, what that is is a well. We probably we probably need the map operator too. So let's grab those two things and then come over and we're going to add those imports to our component so we, that we can use those pieces. And then, uh, let's see, get, we're gonna want, we're gonna want that snippet. And they're creating, they're creating a service here. So we're gonna try to do it just all directly from within our component. Um, and so they're, let's see how they're doing this. They're load user, and they just have a function or a method on that they're calling load user on. Um, I know there's a better way to do that. Um, they're wiring up a button to make the request. So uh, we can start with that. So we can add that same button to our to our component. We'll click it, which will call the method to, to do the request. Let's give that a go. That'll at least get us started. And then we can talk if we, you know, we can kind of go from there. So let's add a button. So we'll say button and then click is the event that we want to resp resp respond to. And then we'll say load uh, video games. So the syntax might look a little odd putting the, the click event in parentheses, but this is the way um, in Angular that, that you, you are able to target what event that, you, that you're wiring up this method to. So here we're saying that, hey, when the button is clicked, we want to call load video games. Load video games uh, doesn't exist, so let's let's add that. So over in our class, we have a couple of properties right now, but now we need to add uh, a load video games method on our class. And then inside of there, so what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to inject HTTP uh, as a service into our component. And so we're going to add a constructor. Okay. And then we're going to want to, well, we'll say private HTTP and that is of type HTTP. And there's nothing else that our constructor is doing. It's empty. So I can just go ahead and put that curly brace back up here. Angular uses dependency injection. So when we need to use a service, uh, whether it's a service that we've created or a service that it provides, um, you need to, to say, I need an instance of that. So we're here we're saying we want an instance of the HTTP service and the private keyword here, this is um, TypeScript syntax. This says make me a private uh, a private property. So that would be equivalent to the same private HTTP. That would be the same thing. But here here we can here we can just do the shortcut and put the private keyword there, which is really nice. Then here we can say this dot HTTP, and we can say get. And then we need the URL. So here's where we're gonna put in our URL to our ASP.NET Core. So it was localhost 5000, API, video games. Then we need to subscribe. So the HTTP service uses RxJS observables. So in this case, when we call get, that returns an observable. We can see here an observable that's gonna have a value that's a response. And we can subscribe to that then, um, which is a way of, of saying, hey, when, when, cause this is asynchronous, 
when the result comes back, then we want to to have we want to know about that and we want to to work with it. We want to do something with the result. So what we're going to do then is we're going to so subscribe and in their example they used they used the map operator. So get oh I see they just mapped and then they write so they are translating this. So let's we'll do this. We'll say map and map is is a rxjs operator that allows you to when a value comes in allows you to do something to it so we're going to say that our response is of type response which is one of the imports one of the imports that we did that we imported from the at angular http module up here so we have at response and we're just using an arrow function here. So we'll say response goes to, and then we're gonna call the JSON method on that response. So just to, to recap, we say this HTTP get, make a get request on this URL. When a value comes back, we want to map that value. And so we'll get a response. And then we're taking that response and calling JSON here. And then if we, at the end of this, if we subscribe, then we can say data and we should, let's just console log this for the time being. We should get some data back um, or <laughs> we're gonna get an error. So if we come back over to our application, oh, where was it at? Not there, here it is. Oh, our button doesn't have any content. Let's fix that. So app component, and then let's add uh, get video games. Okay. And I notice the streaming is, oh, okay, clear it again. So let's click our button. So get video games. All right, and let's open up the web tools and see what is going on. Okay, which is what we expected. We said failed to load resource, connection refused. Remember we talked about that, that if we weren't hosting, right now our Angular application is coming from localhost port 4200 and our API is over on localhost 5000. So they're different domains, different websites. And so even though um, if, if our web API had been configured to allow cross-origin requests, that would be okay, but it doesn't. So we're running into this error. So the way that we're gonna work around this is that we're going to add a bit of configuration so that our, our bundled files, when we ng serve and our application is packaged up, we want to copy that over to uh, a different location. We want to put that in that www root folder over in our ASP.NET Core project. So just a few more minutes. This Hopefully if we can get this last piece snapped in here, then we'll see this work and that will finish up. So if you're wondering when this is going to end, we're getting really close with any luck here. <laughs> so um, there is a developer named Rick Strahl that I saw him recently give a great presentation on ASP.NET Core and Angular. So let's see if we can find that, here it is. So he did recently a blog post where he, he's been uh, maintaining this album viewer sample application and he recently upgraded it to ASP.NET Core 1.1 and Angular 4. And I noticed uh, earlier this week that way down at the bottom here, he talks about this very issue that we're talking about um, where he mentions, hey, you know, we're going to break out our Angular project into its own source folder, which is what we did. But he wants those files to be copied over into this www root folder. And so we're gonna grab this little bit of code right here. So I haven't tested this, so hopefully this is, this is going to work. If we add an Angular CLI JSON, we should be able to, or maybe that already exists in our project. Let's go take a look and see. Maybe it's already there and I just didn't even open it or notice it yet. 
So I'm looking, ah, there it is. So we already have one. Let's go take a look to see what's in it right now. Ah, look at that. So we already have inside of this, this apps property, we already have an outer that's set to Durst or Dist, excuse me. So if we go look here, uh, do we see that? I don't see that Dist folder, it's interesting. Huh, I wonder if it's cleaning it up. Maybe it's cleaning it up. So let's do this. Let's change this to, actually, we got to go up a level. And then it's web app. And then it's www root. And let's see if we, if we ng serve, if those files will get copied over to our web app project in the www root folder. Okay, so the server's starting up. It's now using Webpack to bundle. Uh, everyone's view. I've always preferred ASP.NET Core Web API to MVC because of its versatility to serve different types of clients, but I have struggled with the security side of things with regard to user roles. Um, yeah, I think that'd be a great life coding. Um, I think it would be great to take this project and continue to like add data persistence on the back end. We could add in uh, authentication. So I'd love to do this again. Uh, so check out the schedule and uh, we'll make an announcement sometime soon. I'll work with Kenneth and work out when, um, when we could do that. So let's see if we come over to here and we look in Wow, I don't see our www root folder at all now. What the heck happened? Interesting. Just wiped it out. <laughs> let's, I can't remember if we had, uh, so let's open up another instance of PowerShell and let's build and run. Let's go to our desktop. Uh, I think I was in live coding. Excellent. Web app. Okay. Yeah, it completely wiped out. That's interesting. I wonder why Webpack is doing that. There's something that we're... So let's, let's try .NET build and .NET run, but somehow I'm... It's like it's hiding the folder or something or just deleting it, probably to clean it, but... Let's see what happens when we now request this content or let's run our application and then browse to the root of the app and see what happens. And if this doesn't run, we'll do it more of a brute force fashion. We'll, we'll bundle our app and then copy and paste the files over um, just so that we can kind of get past this hurdle. And then we'll, we'll treat that as a follow-up item later on. Okay. So now we're just going to browse to the root. Actually, I need to, let's, let's do default. So let's go to index.html. Yeah, it's not there. So let's do this. Let's stop. Well, I don't think we need to stop anything, but let's go to PowerShell over here. Actually, no, I don't want to terminate. Let's let's go let's go use Explorer. And let's go take a look at what's in our client app folder. Huh, that is so interesting. So client app is running, but I'm not seeing any so this is clearly something I'm not understanding about Angular CLI and where these files are ending up. I wonder if there's a command that we can use to publish. And I'm wondering if I'm not showing hidden. So let me go to options and then view, uh, show, no, I'm showing everything. So where the heck is that going? Yeah, it's not there. Yeah, I don't see where our bundles are, are landing. 
So it must be it must be sending that information to. Well, let's go take a look at Rick's article and see if we can figure out what we're doing wrong here. Ah, so we need to do an ng build prod. So let's try that. So instead of, you know, I bet in order to get this like, uh, oh, that's the wrong PowerShell. In order to get the the interaction of editing and the auto refreshing, it's probably doing some sort of magic behind the scenes on where it's bundling those files to in order to do the watch. So let's let's do an actual production build. So that was ng build dash dash prod. So ng build dash dash prod. And let's see if that actually copies the files then over to the www root. Okay, it's bundling. Get close. Ninety-two percent. Then it freezes. Okay, there we go. Now let's go over to here. Okay, this is looking promising. We now at least have a dub 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 root. Ah, and there we go. So there are our bundles and an index HTML file. So let's come over to our ASP.NET Core web app. Oh, we need to run the server. I think. I think I did. I shut that down. Uh, web app, huh, interesting. Oh, you know what? Let's go check our configuration. Oh, I'm in the wrong, pl uh, no, no, it's there. Okay, so startup. And let's make sure that static file, well, static file uh, handling should be there. Yep, use static files. So that should work. Index.html. Yeah, we should be able to actually let's add let's add one more. Let's add default files in here. Okay. And then let's build. Oh, I didn't build. Let's build and run. And we'll see if we can get it to serve up the index HTML file. Build. And then run. Okay, come back over here. Okay, excellent. We shouldn't even need to put the index.html because, because of the default files that we're handling now. No, nope. that's still not working. Interesting. But we, needed, but we needed the default files in order for it to allow us to browse to index.html. That doesn't sound right for some reason. <laughs> so let's get games. No, it's still not working. So let's inspect, see what the error is that we're getting. No, no. Oh, that's right. We were console logging it. So look at that. We're getting our data, but we're not binding it yet. So we have our objects. Okay, we're getting close here. So let's go back over to our Angular app and back over to our component. And we have our data now, but instead of console log, actually we'll, we'll leave that in there. We'll log to the console, but we'll also set our property now in our component. Oops. Uh, my indent indentation here is getting out of control. <laughs> okay. And then I need this bit. Oh, this doesn't need to be on its own line. There we go. Okay, so console log data, and then we'll say uh, this dot 
video games equals data. Okay. And then over here, let's do an ng build dash dash prod again. We'll bun rebundle our application and we'll see if we can get our, our, our data to actually bind. And you know, I use the same titles in my, in my static collection. So I think we need to, I think we need to eliminate that <laughs> as a possibility because my, yeah, we're, it would be difficult for it to know or for us to see when that change actually occurs. So let's eliminate that. So it's just an empty array. Okay, and unfortunately we have to do this one more time because I made that change. I don't think that that got picked up. So we'll bundle, build our application and we did the ng build dash dash prod. So it gets copied over to our ASP.NET Core project. I think really the way to go here is to add cores support to our ASP.NET Core API so that we don't we don't have to keep doing this build and copy. Um, that would allow us to make the request against our local host 5000 um, web, you know, the web API itself running locally without having to copy these files over every time. This this gets to be a little a little cumbersome and a little tiresome to have to do. So it's definitely not the way to be developing applications in the real world. So let's refresh that. Okay, should we see no binding? Because I and now we're just binding to an empty array. And we call get video games and our data appears. So that's pretty sweet. So let's do this. Let's we have just a test to make sure that are we actually um, hitting our API? Well, let's use Postman to do a get, but then let's go back and do our post. Okay, there's Halo. I don't remember what the second one was. Oh, the second one was Halo again. Oh, there's Mario Kart. So we'll post Mario Kart. And then if we come back over here and click Get Video Games, and there you go. Now we're getting the data from our API with the two additional items um, that we just used Postman to add to the collection. So I think we're gonna call it good on that front. Um, I will upload. Um, so look in the comments for, for this video and I'll post a link or I'll tweet out a link to the code that we worked on today. Um, so the ASP.NET Core project and the Angular uh, app, um, both of these things I'll, I'll post up so you at least have the code that we're working with here. There's a ton of improvements that we can do. Um, so let me think about that. Tweet at me. Um, I'm at SmashDev on Twitter. Let me know what you'd like to see next. I've seen a request for doing identity. Um, we could certainly cover that. We'll cover other things as well. Um, be great to, to add a form here so that we could add additional video games and improve the design of our application. Our design is, is pretty lacking right now in general. Uh, we could work on making that better uh, and just delving more into the Angular side of things as well. So let me know what you think. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today and watch this. And um, we'll be back with more ASP.NET Core and Angular content, I'm sure. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Thank you.